So now that we've covered learning outcome one, and in that learning outcome one, what we've looked at is um, the different types of organizations, how they operate in a global environment, and when they operate in a global environment, what, uh, laws and legislation, or what kind of you know compliance they have to have, uh, both in compliance in terms of uh, both in terms of compliance and responsibilities that they need to have when they operate globally. So we'll stick to one of the organizations like uh, you know Primark or Tesco uh, or Marks and Spencer uh, for carrying forward that discussion to learning outcome two. And in learning outcome two, we are primarily looking at understanding you know the um, UK economy. And here, what we want to be able to understand is what is the legislation which the companies have to comply with. What are the tools? and mechanisms which are available with the UK government. Say, for example, we have to look at a country here in this case. So the idea would be to look at specifically understanding this from point of view of the United Kingdom or Great Britain. So here, what we will look at is, we look at a company which um, uh, you know operates within the UK and also operates globally or has businesses or you know strategic business units abroad. And here, what we will look at is we will understand what um, is the effect of you know government policies on the operations of that business and at the same time we will look at certain aspects of you know the economic impact which tends to happen both from internal as well as external factors happening uh, and affecting the operations of that company so part of the presentation that we will go through some of the slides that we will uh, you know go through to in today's session have been picked up from uh, a presentation uh, made by Andrew Walker who is a BBC correspondent and covers the economic side of things uh, economic reports uh, you know on 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 the BBC so the idea is to concentrate on understanding the current economic environment which is external to an organization and how is it going to affect the business uh, both in terms of operating in the UK and uh, operating globally. The reason I have chosen this presentation is because it kind of uh, is very updated from the circumstances and the environment which is currently affecting the business in the UK, which is the talks about Brexit, uh, Britain leaving the EU, the you know the process of whole process of uh, leaving the EU within the next two years, and how will it impact you know, businesses which operate within the UK are based in the UK, but operate globally. And the second part of the presentation is what we will uh, try and understand would be just go through some of the key terminology in this particular unit would be to understand uh, things about, you know, government policies, common instruments which they use, the monetary and the fiscal instruments that they use to be able to regulate growth uh, in the economy and obviously how that uh, uh, you know, the policies which are uh, used by the government affect the uh, businesses externally, obli internally. So is that okay? Yes. So you've got a lot of slides in this presentation, but some of the slides are very brief. They are just a few bullet points. And the idea is to try and make you aware of as many concepts, uh, you know, as possible so that when we look at, say, for example, the indicative content, learning outcome two, Although there are only two tasks, but there's a lot of indicative content which we need to get a firm grounding on from a point of view of, you know, um, studying something like this in the higher uh, levels. For example, when you do your top up, you will be looking at, uh, you know, studying uh, a particular unit, which will be looking at understanding the economical impact. Uh, basically, it's studying economy and macro and microeconomics. So it is good for you to look at maybe some of these things um, and familiarize yourself with the key terms and terminology, which is, uh, you know, related to this particular uh, learning outcome. So in short, this learning outcome becomes a full unit at level six, which becomes an economic uh, science, something of economics and business. Awareness. And it's important for you to understand the key terminology concepts so that you can develop it from the, when you study it, uh, you know, in the final year. So let me begin by looking at, you know, the brief uh, process of understanding, you know, obviously we are aware that UK is leaving um, the European Union. It has been a part of European Union, both in terms of uh, fiscal and monetary for just over 40, I think 42 years. But because we voted to leave the EU, uh, you know, there are impacts or there are um, kind of, you know, um, 
um, let's say that there are positives and negative imp- uh, imp- uh, imp- factors which are impacting businesses in the UK. Now, one of the f- few things that we looked at, and this is primarily just the news bit, is that when we looked at voting to leave the EU, uh, 52% people voted yes and 48% voted no. Now, the immediate impact of that particular referendum vote was that short term, when we look at short term and we look at long term, short term impact was that there was a fall in the value of sterling. That means pound to euro uh, exchange ratio, uh, you know, or exchange rate actually fell. So sterling lost 15% uh, of market value as compared to euro. So if I recall, you know, last year, we were looking at getting anywhere from one pound to one is to 30, one is to 35, uh, you know, one is to 1.35 kind of a ratio. But today the pound has dropped to, uh, you know, if you have to look at the ratio, it's one is to 1.2. The other bit is that a lot of businesses which basically operate within your particular, uh, you know, had a bit of a concern saying that, you know, now that if we leave the EU, what kind of ruling rules regulation will be followed? And from that point of view, you know, what will be the impact on, uh, in particular um, companies operating and based in the UK but operating within the European Union. So short term impacts was fall in uh, you know the exchange rate. We also had a bit of uh, confidence being lost by businesses, a bit of uncertainty coming in and the whole process of exit happening for the next two years you know is considered short term because in, in this particular process of negotiations which EU um, and you know the Minister David Davis will go through with Michel Barnier or, or the European Union uh, representative. What will happen is we will come out with some sort of a interim trade deal which will allow us to continue to trade with Europe and get some of the uh, you know flexible benefits that we get being a part of the European Union. So what we've seen is that there was an immediate fall in the stock markets. So when we looked at the FTSE, uh, there was a strong fall in in the FTSE. The rate of inflation is gradually rising. Uh, the Bank of England, uh, you know, target is about two percent, but they use the method of quantitative easing, or use some of the policies like the monetary policy, which we will look at uh, in, in a subsequent slide, which is basically reducing the interest rate on the capital charged by Bank of England. And we are probably, uh, in, in my living memory, you know, we are probably experiencing the lowest interest rate. Of England has ever had in the last 500 years, where it's become constant at you know one quarter of a percent, um, and it's been static at that particular percentage for I think about 10 years now. So <clears throat> there was a bit of a political uncertainty because of the snap election being called. So these are all factors which affect businesses uh, from external perspective because these are factors which are not in the control of uh, the businesses themselves directly. Is that okay? Yes. So when we look at you know political uncertainty, when we look at the sterling rate, we look at the drop in the stock markets, um, you know the snap elections. These were things which were not in the control of the businesses, and they were pretty pretty much termed. They are pretty much termed as something called external factors, which affect the business or the organization. Now what we have seen in general, and the forecast is when we look at going forward on Brexit, is that we are going to generally see a fall in sterling as against the dollar, as against the pound. I think the growth rate for, uh, you know, as a market has been revised downwards because the exit, which has been planned, so we've gone down from a, uh, you know, growth rate direction of two, two and a half percent to about one, uh, just over one percent. Um, and obviously there's a bit of an uncertainty both in the political as well as the economic climate because after the less staff elections, uh, the current prime minister lost, uh, you know, the majority in the parliament. They have, uh, support of the DUP because of which there's a political uncertainty and the political uncertainty leads to economic uncertainty in terms of not having a very fixed uh, confident political climate that okay the government could topple the labor government could step in and you know these are things which basically externally affect uh, businesses now so far there was a lot of talk of doom and gloom that okay Brexit will lead to a fall in business, the economy will contract, all that stuff. But nothing of that sort has happened so far. So we are not in recession, and this was a short-term, uh, you know, uh, let's put it this way, a short-term threat at, at that point in time, which was being posed because of Brexit. 
was that Britain might get into uh, a recession has not happened. That's all the other impacts of Brexit which have happened and they are affecting businesses globally, not so much directly with, the, with relation to UK, but UK companies, but yes, if they are affecting, you know, other businesses globally, some of the businesses who are looking at investing into the UK, uh, maybe starting operations, making some form of major investments. When we heard uh, these announcements came in is that Nissan, for example, Toyota, for example, which have automobile manufacturing within the UK in Sunderland, in West Midlands, decided to hold investment because they said we weren't very clear in terms of um, you know the policies which will be coming in uh, post Brexit. So some of these also were identified as you know risks directly to business. Now we have Toyota Motors operating out of the UK, which is a fully owned UK subsidiary, uh, but obviously it's a part of a larger setup of Toyota Motor Corporation globally. But depending on the outcome of Brexit and the the policies which shape up, this will have a short term impact on the business but from an investment point of view could have a long term impact because if the import duties are imposed on vehicles which are being manufactured here and then exported into europe um if there is a 10% cess which is levied that means car production or car manufacturing in the uk would become more expensive than what is in mainland europe so from that aspect you know it is important uh, to understand that this could be short term being planned but in the long term could effect the the organizations which uh, you know kind of uh, export a lot of goods outside the uk especially the automobile uh, you know, sector. Okay? yeah now in terms of when we look at investment you know um, if the political climate becomes uh, uncertain you normally see that it also has a direct bearing on the investment coming into the country so from a point of view of foreign investors investing into the country uh, additional, uh, you know, FDI as we call it, foreign, di foreign direct investment, which comes in from a lot of banks and uh, 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 bonds, which are issued by countries. Development Bank ABD, which has been, you know, created by China. So when we look at all those things, what we do see is that it affects the organizations working within the economic environment externally, because if the environment is growing and there is a uh, positive political climate, positive economic developments, then they lead to positive political developments. And in general, the businesses flourish because there's investment coming into the country. But if the reverse has to happen, what tends to happen is that the firm put on hold the investment that they're trying to make, um, you know, in the particular economy, in a particular country. So when we look at UK in particular, there were a lot of deals which went on kind of hold because of the process because of the outcome of the referendum. But it is latest because some of the things started to become clear and we it was pretty much certain that the Brexit is going to happen and the process is going to start when we trigger the Article 50. Then these uncertainties started to go away or in the short term started to kind of taper off. So when we look at these impacts which are happening with regards to uh, you know any business or any organization within the UK, we term them as external fact, uh, uh, you know, external uh, uh, factors which affect the business, and this, and these factors in the short term, to create you know some sort of uh, burden on the business because if the pound is to fall, exports become easier, but if the pound is to become uh, dearer with regards to the euro, then imports become uh, you know what you call dearer. So that means when we buy goods here, goods and services here. It costs us more if the pound is expensive. That means we need to buy more and that goes to become cheaper in the UK. But if it is to become weak, that means the pound depreciates, then in terms of importing the same goods from outside for consumption and sales in the UK would become you know, expensive. So we have, what we have seen over the years, um, I don't know in terms of, you know, I've been probably driving for about 20 years, but I've seen the cost of fuel rise from about 69 pence or you know somewhere in the region of 64 pence a liter to today at about 114 or 115 pence a liter and the reason why that has happened is that over the years the exchange rate the fluctuation in the currency between the dollar and the pound has kind of you know um because of political climate or economic climate 
has, has, has keeps changing. It affects businesses within the UK because everything in our country travels by road. Most of the transportation is by road. And when you look at that, if the freight cost is to increase, then the cost of living starts to rise. And because of which, what you get to see is that the prices in 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 the shops and in the retail outlets they begin to rise. Is that okay? Yeah. Is that something that you've imported into? Sorry, can you repeat that, please? I'm saying in in terms of the general rise in prices over the years because of the fuel for costs rising. Have you? Yes. That as we've grown up, obviously, you know, from childhood to but you know, I remember. I think I probably my faintest memories are about 39, 40 pence a liter. You know, the early, I would say 90s, late 90s, I believe. But then slowly and gradually, you know, it's cropped up to about 114 because the government has put in VAT. VAT, uh, you know, has been increased from 17 and a half to 20 percent. And then those as well, and VAT is one of the biggest com components when we look at, you know, in particular the, um, uh, you know, the one of the main components of uh, tax earning for the government uh, when we look at fuel costs. Yeah. So, because the Brexit is happening, the government, we, what we are trying to do with this few slides that we are trying to go through, we are trying to understand how the UK economy is kind of in general shaping up to changes happening because of Brexit. And the idea is that if we go out of the uh, European Union, at some stage, we have to have some sort of a pact and become a part of, you know, World Trade Organization. There will be some free trade agreements that we will want to do, and that is what the negotiation is currently happening. Is that oh, we are part of mainland Europe, or we are a part of Europe, we are not a part of EU, but Britain wants to negotiate certain, um, you know, uh, things within the uh, exit, which will allow us to trade without any barriers uh, with, with Europe in particular. So, for example. There are other markets like Norway and Switzerland, which have the access to the single market. And this is term that you get to hear a lot in the news, that one of the key considerations of negotiation uh, between the two teams is that Britain wants access to the single market, but wants to remain outside the European Union. And for which we need to be able to pay some sort of, uh, you know, a royalty fee, and which will allow us to trade freely with all the 27 countries. And that is important for businesses is because that would mean that we will still be able to follow the law, you know, for example, the law and the rules and legislation and be able to trade with Europe and export goods or import goods from Europe for the purposes of, uh, you know, consumption. And that would mean that the businesses will have to deal with less paperwork. That means a legislation here in the UK would have a corresponding legislation in, in, in Europe. And that is what the task at hand is with the Brexit team to create a legislation which is in European Union. And when we pull out, they need to have a subsequent legislation which matches that so that the businesses can follow it and then still have that same paperwork and still continue to do business with uh, Europe. An example here would be the European Court of Justice, you know, ECJ as we call it. Now, when we pull out of EU, the ECJ as of now is the highest court and has the powers to overrule some of the rulings which even our high court or Supreme Courts uh, decide. So most of the law, when we became a part of EU, we had corresponding legislations which had been introduced to match the European legislation. Is that something that you uh, kind of heard or, you know, can you relate to? Uh yeah, I think I'll cover something like this in assignment 4.1. Right, okay. So when you look at, yes, that's correct. Yeah, in that business environment, yeah, that's correct. So when we look at some of the bits and pieces of news that we look at, um, we did get to hear it in the news that there are some 13,000 plus legislation or, uh, you know, amendments to the law which have been introduced because Britain joined European Union. So from time to time, we have kind of, you know, um, added or amended our laws to include the European Court of Justice or European Union's uh, legislation into our law. Now, if we are to go out, that means those legislations or 
acts which have been passed in the parliament have to be kind of uh, divorced. That means we have to kind of give them up and again go back to our own law. Now, access to single market would ensure the reason why the government is looking at negotiating hard and the business is lobbying behind the government to uh, gain access to the single market is that we will end up keeping some part of that legislation in our laws which will allow the businesses to seamlessly trade across Europe even though they are uh, uh, as a country, as, a, as an organization, they are outside the European Union. Okay? And at the same point in time, the government and the departments will go out and seek free trade agreements with other countries which will allow direct trade agreements to be done as against now the current situation is that if we have to forge an agreement with uh, a particular economy then the European Union negotiates on behalf of all the 27 countries and negotiates a policy to be able to do trade and do trade deals with that particular country. So for example we look at Turkey, European Union does a single deal with Turkey as a country and that is then applicable and that deal which is done then is used by all the countries in the European Union to be able to trade with that country. Something similar is going to be done I think for Brexit but that will be an external factor that will affect businesses. Okay. Now going further what we want to be able to do is understand um, the clear um, terms which are basically used, uh, you know, uh, from a point of view of understanding government policies. Now, what are the measures which government looks at to influence active business organization? So, for example, when when you look at VAT being charged, when you look at corporate taxation, uh, you know, these are things on which the government looks at uh, be taking, um, uh, what do you call, um, inputs from pressure groups and a lot of lobbying happens with the business organizations, say for example the Institute of Directors, IOD, when you look at a lot of other organizations which is kind of moving around with the government to be able to introduce favorable policy which kind of are pro-business, which means which promote businesses and they promote the growth of businesses in general and that in, in effect leads to creation of employment and economic well-being. Now these factors are factors which we need to understand and some of these factors are instruments as we call them, common policies uh, uh, are called and they are used by the government to, be able to uh, move the economy favorably forward in terms of growing the economy. So let's look at some of these terms. Now there is a demand and there is a supply side of things in the economy. So when we look at the demand side of things, the demand side of things is the government is trying to create more jobs, more employment. They are trying to, you know, reduce the inflation. They are trying to, in general, promote economic well-being within the uh, uh, within the country or within the economy. Now, for demand side of policies, we basically look at two policies, which is fiscal and monetary policy. Okay, and these are the two instruments or policies which the government uses to create demand or you know, kind of. Uh, as we say, um, drum up, uh, what do you call, uh, let's put it this way, it creates, uh, what do you call, I'm trying to look at a simpler term rather than a technical term. So with the use of monetary and physical policy, the government tries to move the economy forward, to grow the economy in general. Now in terms of the side of uh, this, what we understand here is that this is the consumption which the consumers do. So if the if there's an organization which is producing, say for example, cars, then these cars are being bought by consumers, and the supply side of things would mean that you know if there is uh, a demand in the market, that means the companies which produce goods and services need to produce them enough so that they can kind of fulfill that uh, demand in the market. And that side of things, when they look at um, providing the goods and services is nothing but supply side of things. And when we look at supply side of things, we look at you know supply side of policies, and that also we will look at. So let's look at basically what is fiscal policy. Fiscal is something which relates to finance, and fiscal policy is when the government changes the level of its spending or the level of taxation to influence the economy. In short, 
Now, have you seen in the last um, or have you heard in the last few weeks, months, whenever the budget is coming out or there is a you know interim statement which is done, like the autumn statement which will happen uh, in the parliament would be, it will talk about the level of government borrowing. The government is borrowing less as compared to what it had borrowed last year, same time or in the same quarter. And that would mean that it will reduce the debt burden in terms of uh, government borrowings. Is that something that you've seen in the news or heard in the news? Um, not that part, no. Right, okay. Basically, there are terms that you will get to see and, uh, you know, hear in the news. When you look at it for the next, uh, you know, uh, couple of weeks, you need to keep an eye out uh, for something wherein it will give out figures and facts about the level of borrowing the government is doing from, uh, you know, the European Central Bank. And in some cases, our borrowing on a quarterly basis is roughly in the region of about 90 billion pounds. And in order to reduce the debt burden that we have, the government is looking at borrowing less and less so that they can reduce the deficit uh, which has been created, you know, in the last 10 to 12 years. And that would mean if they borrow less, then the government is also looking at reducing spending in public uh, sector. So there is a bit of an austerity. This word you must have heard about in the news. The government austerity measures are not having favorable response from the peop uh, you know, public in general. Have you heard of the term austerity? Yeah. That means the government is basically cutting, cutting down on, ten, con, uh, on its expenses. You know, it's it's making less money available for some of the public services, or you know, there are cuts which are being done to try and save costs, to try and save money, so that the overall debt burden could be reduced. Now, there are certain objectives of the fiscal policy. The fiscal policy then basically looks at you know driving the demand in the economy. That means the government is trying to push or pump money in the in the economy to try and stimulate growth or try and stimulate demand. And the reason why it wants to do that is if there is more demand in the market, then unemployment goes down. That means people can come off benefits. Unemployment rate has been reducing for the last, I think, 16 months. And today, from the time the economic, uh, you know, the employment rate has been tracked, I think in 2001 onwards, it is the lowest, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the country at this moment. I think it stands at about 4.6%. At the peak of recession, this rate of unemployment had gone to up to about 15, 16, 17 percent. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Now, the other thing is one of the other fiscal instruments which the government has is it is called inflation. Now, inflation is nothing but if the demand starts to go up and if there is a lot of um, money available in the market, what tends to happen is that it tries to drive up the uh, inflation in the economy. And one of the key things which the government looks at from a point of view of controlling uh, you know, inflation, inflation means nothing but it is basically the cost of goods or you know, it is the price of goods that you buy in the market. Now, if the price of the goods increases, what tends to happen is people have less money in the pocket to buy other things. If the price of the goods goes down, that means the products or the services become cheaper. Then people have more money to spend in their pocket because that money, same money can be used for spending into other areas. Is that okay? Yeah. So one of the things which the government looks at controlling always is the price level of good or price point of goods and services being sold in the market. So if the price of the, say for example, if the price of milk, I don't know whether you realize, but the price of fuel, for example, has been going up from 2007 because of the Gulf War and, you know, onwards from 2001, 2002, it has always been going up. Yeah. And that is why they've introduced this fuel, uh, you know, leveler in terms of the indicator. That means if the stock market price or the barrel crude, uh, you know, oil price goes down in the market, we do see a slight bit of drop at the prices of the pump. But if it begins to go up, then uh, you know, the prices in the pumps also begins to, uh, begins to grow, uh, go, go up. So from that aspect, the government has set a target of 2% rate of inflation for, for the Bank of England. And the Bank of England uses some of these instruments like the fiscal policy, 
a monetary policy to be able to control inflation because if they can't control the prices of good and um that means if they can't control the uh, prices of going good going up then it has to be less money to spend and in that way that makes the, the unattractive the demand reduces and because of which the businesses and the whole economy starts into a bit of recession now there are some problems in terms of uh, with uh, fiscal policy now some of the problems could be the fact that if the government pumps in too much money into the market then what tends to happen is because the money is available at a cheaper or uh, is easily available credit for example becomes easily available then that causes uh, you know some adverse effects as well now one of the adverse effects that you will see if more money is made available uh, in in the market and the bank of england has used something called quantitative easing have you heard about this term called quantitative easing no okay it nicknamed as qe the reason why quantitative easing was introduced is that they were after the financial uh, you know crisis the banks which had loaned a lot of money um uh, in in cases to you know different type of people and organizations could not recover that money back and that led to the creation of bad debt now with this bad debt what the government did was it bought that bad debt out and then in a way uh basically looked at you know kind of um let's put it this way they basically bought this bad debt and issued bonds in lieu of that and this unconventional form of making money available to the organizations even though they knew that they have made a mistake in in the case of you know uh, uh making this money available to the organizations they have not done due diligence and due checks they still provided this money because if the banks had collapsed that means the whole economy and the whole monetary system in terms of the banking system would have come to a halt if no money was available with the consumer in the market then the spending would have stopped totally and that would lead to a large level of chaos unemployment low economic growth for a number of years and you know because money wasn't available bank did not have the money to disperse so what it did was it said okay you had a bad debt for so many uh, um, so much money <clears throat> and from such large investors what we will do is you sell that debt to us and in lieu we will give you money so the bank of england actually wrote that um, debt off by doing a process or using a process called quantitative easing so this was an unconventional form of uh, you know uh, policy which the bank used to artificially make money available when banks actually lost out on a lot of money because of bad debt money was not recoverable so in short let me explain uh, and let, let's see if you understood this correctly so if i lend you 100 pounds and you promise that you will return this back to me in uh, in a year's time and you promise that you will make installments of you know say 9 pounds every month but if you fall short in terms of not uh, you know able to repay uh, redo these payments or make these repayments essentially and then happen is that this for example you skip uh, you missed the payment out in january february you made a payment in march but you missed out for another 2 3 months what has happened is that that particular repayments which were planned have got accumulated at your end they are accumulating interest and fines but at the same point in time you are not able to pay that back to me so in this case what will happen is um because this has become a sustained process wherein you are not able to repay that back to me in terms of uh, a loan which was taken out what the bank did was it said okay because this has become a bad debt and this is something that you cannot recover you sell that debt to us and in you we will make that money available to you and this process was something called quantitative easing is that something understood yeah and an example of that would be that the government had to or the bank of england had to step in and bail out the uh, you know two of the biggest or three of the biggest banks like the royal bank of scotland the lloyds tsb bank they had to bail out and part of these bank became you know uh, owned by the taxpayer because of the fact that these banks could not recover the money which had been lent to the housing market in the us or maybe in the far east okay 
So these these are some problems with the fiscal policy which the government is now trying to or the Bank of England is now trying to fine tune. And the reason why they are trying to fine tune is that they see this process as something which is unsustainable. And that is where they also ask the bank to do you know, some sort of a financial measure test uh, or a solvency test at a, at a certain point in time wherein they said, okay, you need to have this much percentage of deposit as liquid deposit in the bank. So I think about 18 months bank, 18 months back, um, again, if this is something that you picked up in the news, the government did what is called Bank of England, something called a stress test. And the stress test was done primarily from an angle to understand if there was this kind of a crisis to happen again in the future, will the banks have enough money to be able to, you know, save the deposit of the, uh, you know, the, the savings of the investors and save the deposits of the customers in the bank. That is why they asked them that, okay, 10% of whatever trading that you do, or it was not specified in the percentage, but the idea was they said that this much amount of money should always be available as reserves in the bank to be able to, uh, you know, overcome any sort of crisis in the future. Okay. And that is where some of these, uh, things were revised and the Financial Standards Authority, FSA, was replaced by the Financial Conduct Authority, which, which, is, uh, which is monitoring the bank and the banking system much more closely. Is that okay? Yeah. Now, there's the other side of policy is what, is what we call is the monetary policy. The monetary policy basically uses interest rate to control the supply of money in, in the market, right? The, the the interest rates in the market as of now by Bank of England, what is the interest rate in the market as of now? What is the Bank of England interest rate at the moment? Uh, you're looking about 0.5%, 1% if you're lucky. So basically the current interest rate which the Bank of England charges is one quarter of a percent. And that has become, that has been at that level, I think for the last 60, 18 months. So there is some discussions by the governor of the Bank of England, uh, you know, Mark uh, Carney, and he's hinted that there were, might be a rate rise because the inflation is creeping up to about 4%, 4.5%. So the one of the ways that they can control the prices, consumer pricing index, that means the prices of goods going up, is by increasing the interest uh, rate, which is charged by them to loan money to the banks. And if the interest rate starts to go up, the inflation starts to come down. That means cheap availability of money then becomes uh, restricted. And because the money uh, becomes restricted to a certain extent, it helps control the rate of inflation or the prices in the market. Okay. And the instrument which the Bank of England utilizes to control inflation and the, uh, sorry, control uh, inflation is through the monetary policy because they can control something called exchange rates or interest rates, not exchange rate, interest rates, which are charged by Bank of England to give money to the banks and interlending uh, of money between the banks. There's another term which I think you should have come across, something called LIBOR. There was a LIBOR scandal a couple of months back and you know, a lot of banks were fined. And what is LIBOR? I will tell you that. LIBOR is basically, you know, it is something which is an inter-banking lending rate, which the banks have with them when they borrow money from each other. Okay? So it is basically an inter-banking rate. That's, uh, that's the full form of the word acronym, uh, LIBOR. And basically, this is something which is an interest rate which the banks charge when they lend money to each other. So if Barclays Capital has to borrow money from Lloyd's TSB, they would charge some sort of an interest rate on the money being borrowed. And that interest rate between the banks would be called something called LIBOR, L-I-U-R. Okay? <laughs> Interbank offered rate is nothing but LIBOR. Now, this is something which is an instrument which the Bank of England uses to control inflation and to control the supply of money, uh, you know, happening in the market. Okay. And this also the direct bearing on the economic growth and also unemployment rate and also affects the organization. 
what will happen if the interest rate goes up? There will be um, if the interest rate goes up. More unemployment figures. Right, that's fine. From an organizational perspective, let's look at we are understanding everything from an economy perspective. It's okay. But from a business perspective, if the interest rate is to go up, what will happen? Increased costs. That is correct. So if you see now a lot of businesses borrow money from the bank to maintain their cash flow uh, in terms of daily, uh, you know, you, they borrow money from the bank to look at daily trading, cash flow and trading, essentially. So Tesco, for example, uh, buys a lot of goods and, uh, you know, raw material from its suppliers. Now, at some point in time, this is all stock within Tesco stores and Tesco warehouses. But at, its, at some stage, this stock is then converted into money again because of the sales. Now, in order for it to buy and have the availability of hard capital, that means if it's coffee worth, say, uh, 100 million, or placing an order of coffee worth 100 million with a few suppliers in South Africa, Costa Rica, and other places, what will happen is that it will need to shell out this money immediately. And it might not have this hard capital uh, in the bank itself. So what it does is it borrows this money and the banks, to a certain extent, the bank that it banks with, extends some sort of an overdraft. In our case, it's an overdraft. But in the case of you know large organizations, it's something called working capital. And this the working capital is essentially managed by the bank. And on, on that working capital, they charge a slight bit of interest rate. That means if you have to borrow this money over a period of 45 days, then we will charge you X amount of interest. Now, if the interest rate starts rising, then the cost of borrowing for the company. In our case, if we go overdraft, you know, on a, on a daily basis, I think most banks charge about 79 pennies to a pound for the overdraft uh, that you have on your bank for, on a daily basis. But if this amount is, say, in hundreds and thousands of dollars, the company would end up paying more interest rate on that uh, you know, overdraft. And that would mean that at some stage, they will have to cover that cost of the overdraft or the increased amount of interest they are paying on that capital by increasing the cost or price of the goods they sell in the stores. Correct? Yeah. Now, if that is to happen, that means overall, if the cost of uh, cost of goods starts to rise, then the people would spend less, and that would lead to something called unemployment, which you said earlier, which is correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So everything from that aspect has a knock-on effect, and that is where the uh, uh, the fiscal policy and the monetary policy is used by the government. Monetary policy, in particular, is used by the government to control the cost of borrowing. Okay. And this cost of borrowing can have a far-reaching effect on businesses as an external factor because the cost of borrowing increases because the interest rate is increasing. That means the businesses will increasingly come under pressure to cover the cost of that interest uh, or the, uh, by increasing the prices at the retail stores. Okay. Now, certain extent of this, when we look at, so we discuss interest rate, but we also look at what are the other things which affect, uh, you know, the monetary policy controls and effects? It controls spending and savings, right? It also controls cash flow, effect on cash flow. It also has an effect on exchange rates for the organization. Okay? Now, if the pound is to go up, suppose, for example, the government increases the interest rate and because of which the borrowing in pounds or sterling will become expensive. And that would mean that the it will have a knock-on effect on the exchange rate of pound in the international market where it's traded. So if you're traveling abroad on a holiday and you want to go to US and you're looking at exchanging pounds for dollars, if you give one pound and you get one and a half dollars, that's good for you, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, if you at some stage are looking at traveling and if you give a pound and you get only one for dollar or one dollar and 10 cents, that means you've lost the dollar is depreciated in value against yeah, the dollar. Yeah. And that also is an effect which happens because of, uh, you know, the interest rate. And that also on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, the Bank of England and the government actually control through the monetary policy. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Now, there are some...
sort of policies, you know, we look at supply side, we talk about policies which basically affect the labor market in particular, right? The product markets in particular, the prices of goods on the shelf, competition, the investment coming in. But these are, uh, when we look at demand side of policy, we talk about monetary and fiscal policy. On the supply side of policies, we talk about labor policy, labor markets and product markets in particular. <clears throat> now, very briefly, let's look at, you know, I'm not going to cover product markets, but labor market, let's look at coverage because this is something, the idea is to understand the concepts here. We don't want to go into every terminology, uh, you know, for this particular learning outcome because this is a learning outcome and a task out of the whole unit. Now, what are labor markets? Labor markets are when you have availability of people who are in, in employment. People want to work in general. They need to be able to find employment. And the government policies in general promote, you know, uh, uh, policies which are favorable for people to go and work, for companies to create employment. Okay? Now, the government sets policies which basically, uh, you know, are... Um, or laws and legislation which gets passed out at, uh, as acts in parliament, then once it becomes an act, then these acts, everybody has to follow because it becomes a, uh, you know, kind of a regulation for every organization to follow. Now, the labor markets, when we say is basically what it tries to do is it creates a balance between using this policy, it creates a balance so that people living within the country are having favorable conditions for employment. One of the key things that you look at when we look at enforcing this policy, when we say labor markets is the government always has a target of reducing immigration from outside the EU. Is this something that you've heard of? No, yeah? no, this not. Okay. So the reason why one of the one of the strong reasons why people looked at Brexit was that people wanted to limit the number people coming into the UK, both from EU and outside the EU. Immigration was a big topic, isn't it? Yes. Some of the people voted for Brexit is because they said, we are fed up of immigration. We don't get jobs. I'm, you know, I'm British. I'm born here, but I'm not able to get a job. Maybe somebody comes in from outside, takes our job. And they see this was one of the key reasons of why people voted against, you know, uh, leaving the EU. So when we look at labor markets, in general, the government policies Government creates policies which are conducive for having immigration from outside, which is coming in and kind of bridging the areas of uh, gap in terms of skills. So there was a discussion and there is a pro-Brexit or, you know, kind of a um, stay in the European Union. There was a discussion that there is in excess of about 49,000 staff which works within the NHS. and this is the European staff which supports the functioning of NHS in the UK. So labor markets mean what they try and do is they try and introduce those policies wherein if there is a specific requirement for a kind of skill set which is required to come into the UK, the government creates policy which allows then people to immigrate or bring in labor from outside uh, the country. And here the idea is the government always tries to balance between the policy so that there is managed migration which happens and also at the same point in time the gap areas which is the people that we are not able to fill in the vacancies are then allowed to come in from outside okay so what is in general the effect of labor market labor market or labor policies basically is something which government tries to create uh, in terms of legislation which allows favorable people uh, or, you know, labor to come in to work into the UK for which we do not have the manpower or the skills. Is that okay? Yeah. And when they do this, what we try and, what the government tries and does is, it tries to seek a balance between the requirements of businesses as well as the requirements of the types of jobs required uh, in, in the economy for people to come and work in. Okay. Okay. And the reason why it is called labor uh, labor market, you know, it is called this term, is because labor essentially means when we look at you know using terms. So I'm going to stretch this to some of the other bits and pieces. Uh, which is, we look at GDP, gross domestic product. We look at gross national product, GNP. And the reason why labor is used as a term is that when we 
at what is the economic output of the country we we kind of calculate the economic output of the country in terms of the sum total of work which can be done by all the people which creates wealth okay so labor is nothing but a measure of work done by each and every individual in the economy who works so if i am working you are working you are contributing towards national productivity and that national productivity is a concept called gross national product that means if there are 33 million people which are in employment as of now we work we have a gross national productivity in terms of economic output at 2.2 trillion dollars which is the economical output of our economy is that something which you can relate to yeah when we say we are the sixth largest economy in the world and that value of 2.2 trillion dollars where that that value come from how does the government calculate or how do we arrive at that calculation of 2.2 trillion dollars in terms of our economy in terms of the value or the the kind of output our economy produces i have no idea <laughs> okay so <laughs> but when we look at that is the what we look at is the economic output of each and every individual in terms of productivity so 33 million people when they work in their jobs in their job role on an average they produce certain amount or get certain amount of income or create certain amount of uh, you know income and that income sum total is nothing something called gross national product gdp or gross domestic product and that is the output of all people working within the economy and that output in terms of money is nothing but our gdp and that gdp basically is equated as the output of uk economy across the year and that is something which is 2.2 trillion dollars okay okay so labor markets why because labor is the measure of work which each and every individual does and conventionally when you look at this particular labor output this is calculated in some sort of money so if i'm working across the year i might say for example hypothetically speaking earning 100000 uh, pounds now when i work and i earn 100000 pound if you have to sum up the total of 33 million people working and earning whatever wages they are earning across the year and you add all of them up that would all add up to 2.2 trillion dollars and that becomes something called gross domestic product that means that is the sum total of all the income which each and every individual in the uh, economy produces when they work or they are able to earn when they work is that okay, okay. yeah yes yeah. and i think the current gdp of uk is about 2.6 uh, trillion dollars 2.2 trillion pounds equated in dollars is 2.6 trillion uh, uh, dollars okay okay good stuff so there are some of the other terms which probably we will skip but it is something that you can we if you want we can go through but these are terms which are um, you know um, some of them are uh, the reason i say this is terms is because these are terms which will at some stage we'll categorize as internal factors or external factors affecting the business okay so the okay. third type of policies we look at is market based policies policies things like you know vat you know tax indirect tax direct tax these are taxation or these are policies which the government then uses to basically influence you know again growth in the market or you know growth in the economy so these are three different uh, three or four different types of things that we need to understand which are a broader subset of government policy so when we look at government policy we look at monetary and fiscal policy we look at basically then market policies we look at environment policies and these then form something called a budget which the government produces every year so that means when the you know the chancellor uh, of the exchequer announces the budget he looks at these four policies uh, these four policies are basically uh, you know there are changes or there are new things which are being introduced with the help of these four policies that is going to stimulate growth in the economy by reducing the interest rate or by uh, you know making sure that quantitative easing quantitative easing continues by the bank of england they will look at basically creating employment in the market by providing some boost to the construction sector or kick starting the infrastructure development programs like the hs2 
high speed rail 2 which is starting or the redevelopment of national highways and these policies help create employment help create economic growth in the in the economy now if you understand this from an economical point of view what that means is the government does not physically go out and make roads or the government doesn't physically go out and make uh, you know the high speed rail what it does is it gives out contracts to organizations or businesses which basically deliver these services correct yeah yeah and what it does in long term is it controls the interaction of businesses and the regulation by introducing regulation keeping the competition under control so that when say for example it is uh, you know it is uh, it is approved the hs2 project the hs2 project was then allowed bidding that means a lot of com private companies were allowed to bid for this uh, you know project and the bidding process allows nobody to single handedly walk off with the project but it creates the competition in your check and make sure that each and every organization which wants to be able to favorably provide these services is able to provide and that is where it tries to regulate you know competition anti competition kind of policies within this whole process of bidding is that okay yeah then to control this process of working within the environment it has a lot of these organizations like have you heard about ofcom yeah of of gem of vat you know office of uh, you know for example certain bodies which have been created by uh, the organization uh, not by sorry not by organization by the government to control a particular sector's operation so of gen for example the office of uh, you know basically which regulates gas prices of what which regulates water pricing in the in in the in the in the markets so these competitive organizations which are semi government organizations keep the uh, private organizations under check by implementing regulation and ensuring audits of these regulations within these organizations so that the consumers are able to get a fair price is that okay yeah Now some of these are obviously they're explained in a bit more detail but you know the idea is we want to get to the basics of it if you look at just summarizing what we've discussed today um i think it's been a bit of a long session but just to summarize i think what we're looking at understanding is what are the factors which affect businesses externally okay today the focus is to understand what affects a business organization externally now that to summarize if you're running a business what affects you government policy and legislation affects you external environment affects you economy affects you and you know the for example any changes in anything related to money affects your business whether it's interest rate whether it's demand and supply whether it's the easy availability of the money inflation all these are external factors which are not in the control of the business affect you externally okay now yeah. in order for the businesses to prosper government has created certain uh you know uh, government has certain instruments we call them instruments and these instruments are of four types they are basically monetary and fiscal instruments they are basically uh you know labor instruments and they are environmental instruments or these are four different kind of policies which the government has to be able to regulate the working environment for businesses and to make it conducive to make it positive and to make it helpful for businesses to prosper and these four policies affect business in different way and the idea of government using these policies is to regulate and create favorable conditions which allow the economy to grow and because if the economy is growing that means the businesses are growing if the businesses are growing that means the employment is being created if employment is there that means the unemployment rate the rate is low and if unemployment rate is low that means people have more money because they are earning they have more money to spend in the market that means the demand for goods and services generally increases in the market is that okay yeah that is what the whole essence of today's session is um i hope uh, you know it has been a bit uh, you know uh, it's been a long session but i hope it has given you some understanding of uh, these external instrument uh, you know external instruments of factors which 
actually affect businesses or organizations uh, from from that aspect yeah okay now what i'm going to do is apart from sending you the copy of this presentation i'm going to send you a two or three page handout which will just have these uh, policies explaining what they are exactly and at the same point in time have a bit of an example towards the end to show an application okay rather than being generic so for example when i know when i know the interest rate goes up what happens is when the interest rate goes up my mortgage goes starts to go up my mortgage repayment starts to go up my car loan payment starts to go up okay cause and yeah. effect when i see the pound actually depreciating that means if i have to buy something from abroad that means it becomes expensive because the pound buys less for what it was buying earlier but yeah. it's from the country cheaper that means the people who are producing goods here can actually access the other markets because uh, british goods then become in demand because they are cheaper than some of the other countries who are supplying goods so there will be specific examples against these policies and it will give you a good understanding of what does this happen so what does inflation do if inflation begins to rise that means prices in general begins to rise that means the cost of milk the cost of bread eggs you know the fuel is rising in the pumps or rising in the outlets that would mean if i am spending more i have less money to spend elsewhere in the market and that in general what tends to do is contract the economy the demand starts to go down and this you know that that means the businesses in terms of production and everything starts to slow down is that okay yeah so that handout when i send you will actually have these in uh, a bit more detail two or three paragraphs but also will have an example which will allow you to understand what happens if it goes up what happens if it comes down okay okay brilliant now what i'm going to do is some feedback on the uh, first unit which you have sent across to me more or less i've read to all the stuff that you've sent um yeah. 99% of that is fine there will be one or two small changes which we'll have to do so that we are able to meet the learning outcome criteria i think okay. we'll have to add maybe uh, you know i would say some total of about 3 to 400 words to complete that unit essentially 300 400 Words. Words. words yeah how Because how would you know, you list out on certain terms which are important for the learning outcome to be met how okay. how many words in total 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 words i'm talking about is 2 to 300 words for the whole assignment for the whole assignment yeah so we could do about 3000 Yeah, that's fine. But you know what we have to do is when we sometimes look at the task. You know, if I look at learning outcome two that we have covered, uh, if you don't mention fiscal policy or monetary policy, I don't give me an example. You know, you would not meet the task. Uh, you know, uh, of learning outcome two, which is two point one and two point two, because they have to be mentioned. Okay. Fiscal and monetary policy. Yeah, because these are two important terms which affect, uh, which basically cover. for the internal impact on the organization so basically the word that you have to use in the assignment would be that there are some government policies uh, and rules and regulations which affect businesses externally for example monetary policy for example fiscal policy now as long as you've explained these two that would mean that you would have covered task 2.1 oh sorry are you talking about this one i'm i'm just oh, giving um... you an example here where with the with with this particular uh, you know task that we've done right now oh oh okay i'll find the one that was the this one oh no, no no that that one yeah. is more or less okay i said 99% of that is okay uh, there is okay. no not much work to be done in that okay yes that's fine yeah okay and i'll yeah. send that written feedback to you over the weekend okay okay brilliant phil oh All thanks right. catch up with you uh, cyphol if you're still there hopefully catch up with you the next session uh, i hope you'll be able to look at that video uh, of join me and maybe enable the sound i know you're able to see this send me a lot of texts but thanks so much for joining in today and uh, have a good weekend we'll catch up next week okay thanks you too take care thanks bye